If you're an early stage Web3 founder, apply to our award-winning accelerator program, Basecamp at outlierventures.io slash Basecamp. We write your first $50,000 check and give you access to 200 mentors, including many of the leading Web3 founders, and a network of 1,000 of the world's leading investors and exchanges. We've helped over 30 startups from 15 countries from all around the world, raise $130 million in growth funding, and can help you fast track product market fit and where relevant, the launch of your token economy. So today I'm really happy to welcome on the show, Aaron Wright, founder of OpenLaw. Welcome, Aaron. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Jamie. Really excited to be here. Yeah, so I'm really looking forward to this one. Um, So I'm going to make an attempt to describe Open a high level, and of course, we're going to unpack and break all this down later. But if you just go off your website, which you know, the language is, I would say, perhaps deliberately neutral um, in, in describing what you're doing. So a kind of digital contraction, contracting platform to eliminate grunt work. Now, that feels like a very generalized statement, and we're going to talk a little bit about exactly what you mean by that, and I guess... The, the kind of current client user base versus perhaps long-term where you envision it to go. But effectively, it says that platform is built for modern law and um, it's secure, um, it's built by lawyers, but clearly lawyers that are native to Web3. And I think that's kind of one of the really important things and reasons why I wanted you on the show. So you yourself are a serial founder. You've sold a company to Wikia called Armchair GM a few years back. And the thing is when you, so you are a founder, you are working and enabling other founders in Web3, um, especially kind of your native Web3 founders around the implementation of DAOs. And in particular, a variation of that that you guys had developed called the Lao. And one of the reasons why I wanted you on is because most of the time when we talk about law or we invite lawyers, ex-lawyers, uh, to talk about crypto, it's usually in the context of regulation. Um, but actually, I think increasingly this theme around governance, decentralized governance, you know, the difference between an executive and the kind of this democratic governance. But then, of course, just the term smart contracting implies that the world of contracting itself is ripe for transformation disruption. Depends how you're how you're looking at it. So I really wanted to, of course, talk about um, open law, but also talk more broadly about DAOs, LAOs. Um, is code law, can it ever be law in a smart contracting sense? Perhaps some of the nuances of on-chain, off-chain arbitration all that good stuff. So so firstly, maybe before we kind of jump into that, coming back to the language point. So, you know, the, the language on the website, as I said, feels quite neutral, i.e., you know, the language is written in a way to not put off a law firm, like a, a traditional law firm, or a traditional kind of corporate entity that wants to improve its contracting. But of course, that is slightly different to the kind of bleeding edge of work that you're doing now in, in DAOs and LAOs. Is, is, I'm assuming that's deliberate, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, op- the genesis of open law really stems from uh, the story of crypto punks more broadly. Um, and um, I think from the beginning uh, and starting in the you know early 1990s, late 1980s, there was this vision of how commerce could look like. Uh, a big piece of that vision is digital assets, things like Bitcoin, for e-currency, which we, we've seen develop. Uh, we also saw with Ethereum, kind of the creation and first implementation of a smart contracting platform. Uh, but there was a related concept called a Ricardian contract, um, which Ian Grigg and a whole bunch of other folks also thought about around that at that point in time. Uh, so I had the pleasure of playing a small role, helping to launch Ethereum, uh, Was got deep into the blockchain and Bitcoin ecosystem starting in 2011. Um, and this kind of third leg in the stool uh, has never been developed. Um, and that really is the core focus of what we're trying to do with Open Law. Uh, we're trying to build out a Ricardian contracting system uh, that can complement smart contracts and more efficiently move digital assets. And we think it's these th- kind of three pillars that will form the basis of the future commercial world. Um, and Open Law 
as a tool is just a powerful way to do that. Uh, we're able to take any agreement, and not only uh, one agreement, but entire sets of agreement gr agreements. Uh, we're able to structure those agreements, uh, turn them into a computer-readable format, and also orchestrate the underlying smart contract calls that may be necessary to, to move around assets. Uh, so uh, legal agreements, um, while dry, they're kind of the dark matter of the uh, commercial <laughs> world. They, they sit everywhere, they're in every single industry. Um, they're obviously very important for financial uh, contracts or financial services, but they really seep and uh, are kind of pervasive in how we structure our world. And so we think the applications for open law are incredibly broad. That being said, um, we also realize that there's uh, great opportunities for them to be used today, um, particularly in areas like DAOs or in other areas where um, you know, Web3 entrepreneurs or other entrepreneurs want to kind of bring blockchain technology to more traditional businesses. Uh, so we're, we're able to do that in a number of, of different contexts. Uh, so I think lots of folks have thought about smart contracts. Lawyers hear smart contracts and they think these incredibly dynamic systems that are going to be able to read and potentially write information, uh, automatically execute things. Uh, an Ethereum-based smart contract or another smart contract running on another blockchain you know, doesn't fundamentally do that uh, in and of itself. Uh, really, a smart contract uh, excels at moving around assets or structuring the movement of assets. Uh, a recording contract kind of fills in all the gaps. So contracts, at least as we think about them as lawyers or as uh, more traditional folks would think about them, uh, they don't just move assets. They don't just perform something. They also manage risk. Um, and uh, a recording contract system is really great at doing that. You can blend together the best of uh, these paper agreements that first emerged, you know, thousands of years ago, uh, to, to manage risk and to structure relationships using natural language provisions, but at the same time, you can get the speed and efficiency uh, of using uh, underlying Ethereum-based smart contracts uh, to move around assets and, and start to build more complex structures. And that's, uh, we think, incredibly important. Um, we think it's incredibly interesting, and we do think it opens up, you know, new pathways to things like DAOs to decentralized arbitration. Uh, to lots of the other concepts that I know many entrepreneurs and other folks have been thinking about uh, for quite some time. Yeah, we had uh, Mark S. Miller of Agoricon uh, a couple of a couple of shares ago, who is the co-founder of um, Agoric and you know, Internet OG. And at the end of the podcast, one of the most inspirational monologues I've ever heard, for me anyway, in the space, which talks about this idea around contracting and you know how contracts and you know finding consensus and removing um the the kind of friction of trust in contracting in a kind of global universal sense like the promise of that at a society, societal level um you i think his his kind of closing term was if you remove the the cost of cooperation you increase cooperation and, and um so I, I think it's as you say often kind of overlooked but just the the power of that recording contracts and, and stuff at scale um, is almost unfathomable. So um, let, let's just give some context to you as a, as a founder. As I said, you know, this is from what I could see your second startup. You seem to, the first one was Armchair GM, LLC, uh, founded back in 2005. Your co-founder sold that to Wikia um, and then ended up working at Wikia. Could you talk us through that? I'm assuming it was some kind of legal tech, reg tech, and Wikia was the acquirer, and then you kind of went on there to, to similarly help develop products, solutions, technologies. Sure, yeah, it was uh, actually pretty far afield from legal tech, but I think kind of all fits together neatly. So it's the Wikia was the for-profit sister project to Wikipedia. Uh, so Wikipedia is obviously not for profit, and Wikia is the for-profit version of it. Um, we developed some technology, uh, that basically extended what Wikipedia can do. A lot of it is now kind of embedded into the core aspects of Wikipedia. Um, and um, we were able to uh, take MediaWiki, which is the underlying open source software, uh, and enhance it, improve it, uh, make it more collaborative. Uh, that kind of formed the base of Wikia, which grew into, depending on the metric that you use, the you know 15th to 17th largest website on the planet, at least in terms of unique visitors and, and page views, according to certain analytics uh, companies. But this notion of open source technology and user-generated technology brought me deeply into uh, the Bitcoin ecosystem. 
very early on, just kind of saw it instantaneously. Um, and once Ethereum uh, was announced, uh, reached out and started working closely with many folks um, in the Ethereum ecosystem, uh, helped do a whole bunch of uh, legal structuring and legal work related to it, um, and also uh, have continued to work with a number of great teams over the years. That have done a lot with Joe Lubin and the folks at Consensus. We've also worked closely with the folks at Chainlink um, and a whole bunch of others. And that um, and that all kind of sits in the background uh, of the fact that I am an academic. So I'm a law professor at Cardozo Law School in New York. Uh, I've had the pleasure of, of uh, thinking about uh, lots of the policy questions and issues related to the technology. I co-authored a book that Harvard published on blockchain law and policy. And that uh, is where the germ and kind of extension of what a recording contracting system should look like uh, kind of uh, fermented. And then we pulled that together um, along with my co-founder of OpenLaw, David Rune, who helped build the Ethereum Java client uh, before um, Ethereum launched, along with others. And we started uh, putting our heads down and really building out OpenLaw. So that, that's a bit of my story. And I understand that um, at the uh, Cardoza School of Law, you also founded a director of the blockchain project and tech startup clinic there. Um, so that was between 2014 to present. Um, and then OpenLaw was founded 2017. So um, so as you say, it sounds like you know, you've, you've been deeply in the space, both academically and professionally, uh, at least since 2014, um, perhaps before, and then uh, led to the founding of of Open Law. Um, could you just talk us through um, the the kind of mission behind Open Law? So I know earlier on in the intro, you, you kind of spoke to, I guess, the the, the opportunity, um, but what led you specifically to found Open Law itself? Yeah, I mean, and like many folks, I became deeply interested uh, in Bitcoin following the 2008 financial crisis. Um, I just felt like something was uh, off and amiss in the entire system, and we could do better. Um, I saw Bitcoin as really uh, the first glimmers of what a future commercial and financial system can look like. I saw Ethereum as an extension of that, uh, but at the same time, uh, deeply aware of how the legal system works. I recognize that there was not just issues in terms of our banking system, but also in terms of our legal system. And so open law and recording contracts, I think uh, in many ways aim to solve that. Uh, contracts are dead objects. They get written, they get stored in flat files, usually in Microsoft Word. People forget about them, they can't understand them, they can't interact with them. Um, and I think that is a travesty. Uh, I think it's a travesty uh, for how we operate society. We're not able to assess risk. We're not able to lower the cost of, of how contracts are assembled or put together or, um, or um, you know, how we structure uh, you know, different relationships. Uh, and that's what we uh, have been trying to solve and been thinking about for quite some time. And we stand on the shoulders of really great folks. Uh, we stand on the shoulders of uh, lots of the early uh, cypherpunks, uh, folks like Mark Miller, who you mentioned before, um, you know, a number of different people that have been thinking about these uh, types of issues uh, from the beginning. And uh, over the past couple of years, we've been fortunate enough to pull together what we think is the first robust recording contracting system uh, where we're actually able to structure these agreements. We built a, um, a non-Turing complete programming language to map out the internal logic of how contracts work. Um, and the smart contract orchestration pieces just means that we can do things a lot faster. Um, and that is what we are hoping to push out to the world. Um, and we envision a future where there's not just a handful of contracts, but the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of contracts that are produced a year uh, can be completely interact, interoperated with uh, and interacted with um, you know, by any computing system in the world. That means that we should be able to distill out the key data points. Uh, we should be able to structure new forms of organizations that are leaner, cheaper, easier to administer. Uh, we should also be able to accentuate lots of the great work that other entrepreneurs are doing in the blockchain ecosystem uh, so that they can manage risks that they may be creating um, and or uh, also uh, make sure that those platforms can seep into more traditional parts of the economy um, around the globe. So it's a, a pretty broad uh, mission, but we think one that's critically important. And at the end of the day, we should be able to uh, lower the cost of creating contracts. 
open up new ways to create agreements, um, structure things in different ways uh, so that we can have more uh, efficient relationships between one another and ideally uh, be able to, to create more trust um, and not just trust in a particular jurisdiction, jurisdiction, but the beautiful thing about blockchain technology and the internet uh, more broadly is that we're able to build systems that operate globally. Uh, so a legal system that can scale globally, I think is incredibly important um, and kind of points to this future state that I think many of us are working towards. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fascinating, just the concept of applying open source principles in that we see in code and software to law um, to kind of evolve that that code base. And so just interestingly, like between your team, like what, what's the ratio split between lawyers and, and coders? Yeah, so it's mostly developers. Um, we have a team of uh, about 10. There's uh, four folks on the team uh, that have a legal background. Uh, you know, some of those are lawyers that also program. Um, so it's about 60, 40 engineer, uh, 40, 40 percent kind of hybrid uh, programmer, developer, uh, lawyer, which I think is important because in many ways what we're doing is translating uh, some of these concepts that lawyers are kind of the, the high priests of things like structure and governance, things like structure and risk, uh, things like um, how certain commercial operations work today. Uh, we kind of feel that in our bones and we're able to implement that into code. And, and once we do that, because it is open source, because it's uh, available for lots of different folks, uh, hopefully people don't need to reinvent the wheel. You know, like in many ways, the legal industry today, it's kind of pre-industrial. It's like a whole bunch of uh, different lawyers sitting in their own cottages, making their own shoes. And we are hopefully can get to a point where this can be streamlined, uh, automated, um, and systematized. Uh, and hopefully that, uh, along with some standardization, can just reduce the costs uh, around the globe. And where we've seen a reduction in costs in the creation and assembly of legal contracts, we tend to see very ro robust marketplaces emerge. Uh, you can think of options exchanges as being a good example. They're trading contracts on those exchanges, but yet there's no paperwork that's being uh, transmitted uh, between parties. In the venture ecosystem, standardization by the National Venture Capital Association here in the US has reduced the cost of raising capital, has led to you know, even tradable contracts there. We saw a bit of that in, during the you know, token boom in 2016 to 2018. And in other industries like ISDA, uh, which, which manages a you know, quadrillion dollar market, um, standardization has led to the wide dissemination of derivatives. And we've seen uh, similar attempts in other financial ecosystems like uh, syndicated loans, et cetera. So, um, you know, disruptive to the legal profession, but transformative to you know, pretty much everything else, especially in the capital markets context. Um, and, you know, you, you reference this kind of eliminating grunt work. And I guess, you know, ultimately that's just the repetitive work that is inefficient and repetitive um, for uh, in, in most industries, especially, you know, I guess, corporate formation and, and, and structuring and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, a lot of what lawyers do quite a bit. They're a little bit like architects and also the, the builders. Uh, so architects will put down, you know, on paper um, the structure of a house or a building. Um, and then, you know, other folks will, will work with the architect to put, put that together. Lawyers do basically the same thing. They'll hear a set of facts, hear about a certain transaction, and then you need to architect and provide counsel and guidance on how something should be structured. And then the mechanical aspects of how it's put together uh, is still done mostly by hand. Um, it's done you know, in Microsoft Word um, where people open up a previous file, they make some tweaks, uh, some adjustments, add in some new language. Um, and obviously that can be get, get very, very complicated at the, the highest ends of the market. Uh, but for many folks, it, it makes, makes lawyers feel a little bit like dentists. They're doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and uh, there's not much um, innovation there. And so it means that it's, it's ripe for automation. I think more broadly, uh, when we start to think about kind of this future vision of, of Web3, uh, where we have new digital identities, uh, new digital entities like DAOs, um, new, new ways to uh, structure certain things, um, what we think open law is useful for is creating that bridge and link to the real world. So as an example, um, with the Lao, uh, we've been able to, uh, through our tools and through some structuring work that we did, house a DAO inside of a US-based limited liability uh, entity. 
uh, such that uh, the paperwork uh, enables um, folks that want to participate in these organizations to do so in a way that should manage their, their real world risk. Uh, so we can limit uh, and narrow questions that may emerge if folks want to engage in this structure. Uh, but this entire suite, along with some work that we've been doing in Wyoming to uh, legally and officially recognize DAOs, means that we can get to a future uh, where setting up a DAO uh, costs $75, the filing fees of the state, uh, the smart contracts are available off the shelf, uh, along with uh, the ability to generate any necessary paperwork uh, that's done. Uh, that means you're, you should be able to join these organizations with a matter of clicks, have all the uh, ancillary paperwork set up um, and you're kind of off to the races. So something today, uh, setting up a fund or fund like structure, which tends to cost you know, $75,000 on the higher end, maybe $25,000 if, if, or $20,000 if you're able to do a really commoditized structure, uh, we can reduce the cost down to $75 plus the cost of gas. Uh, so that's pretty tremendous. And, and I think points to some of the efficiencies that, that we're able uh, and should be able to, to to work towards over the next couple of years. Right. And I guess, um, you know, I've heard the, the Lao as a concept, obviously there is the Lao and then there's uh, Lao as a kind of a concept as a, a legal wrapper, a DAO with a legal wrapper. And as I understand it, there are several variants that you could have. And the reason why you would want to do that, because I think still a lot of people don't fully understand that by creating a DAO, um, even if it has a sufficient degree of decentralization, it doesn't it, it doesn't necessarily remove them from the liability of what that DAO might do, especially from a roles and functions perspective. So the idea is that you would want to domicile in a in a particular jurisdiction so you're not open to litigation in pretty much every jurisdiction that may or may not directly or indirectly interact with that DAO and its value creation, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, the, the story of Laos really started at various different events that MIT can, convened starting in 2015, where we started to think about, uh, you know, what would this DAO structure look like in the wild? Let's say you did want to build a DAO and not just build one, uh, but also have it legally recognized, what would be a good way to do that? Um, and so me and Josh Fairfield, who's a professor at Washington and Lee University in the U.S. and Primavera de Filippi, who had the pleasure of co-authoring a book, and a bunch of other folks began to kind of knock our heads together and, and think about what this could look like. Uh, and it seemed that an LLC structure in the U.S. was a good starting point here. Uh, in part, uh, it was a good starting point because in the U.S. you're able to obtain a limitation of liability, which means that you're only uh, responsible or you're not responsible for uh, certain liabilities that may accrue to an organization. If you're a part of it, uh, the organization is, is primarily responsible uh, for those liabilities. So that means that your personal assets are not put at stake. Uh, and secondarily, in the US, uh, we're able to have this limitation of liability in the entity and also have that entity entirely member managed. Uh, beyond that, uh, in the US as well, there's just such a strong notion of the ability for individuals to uh, contract with one another um, and define their rights and obligations to one another uh, that we recognize that it should be quite easy uh, to put together a structure where the members of that structure agree that they're going to be governed by code. Um, and that's what we've done with the lab. We kind of brought that to life. We navigated through trickier questions related to um, what those interests in the, the DAO may be. Um, and we've made sure to uh, limit the risks that can accrue uh, if you're if you're working together in one of these organizations. So that means if you have other personal assets at stake, uh, if you have you know other ventures uh, that you're part of, uh, you can know what you're walking into uh, when you walk into uh, a DAO like structure. Um, and the cost of setting these things up is going down dramatically, uh, and it's only going to go down over time as kind of the legal framework, at least in the U.S., uh, catches up to it. And it seems like that's that's the direction uh, that we're going. And when you think about just the ability to begin to create these pools of, of capital uh, and deploy those capital, uh, any area where there's a fund uh, could be potentially disrupted. Um, if you believe in this notion uh, that a great way to cut through the you know tremendous amount of information that the internet produces is to do it collectively, to use kind of a hive mind approach, and you can see DAOs uh, transforming the way the venture capital industry works, transforming how 
uh, you know, hedge funds or other asset managers operate, uh, transforming how people decide to fund creative works, uh, transforming uh, other aspects of the economy where, where there's a fund-like structure. Uh, critically, I do think for Web3, uh, these funds are important because for the most part um, in the blockchain ecosystem, we've been building a robust trading infrastructure and trading infrastructure is fantastic. Uh, but organizations and DAOs are sticky. Communities are sticky, uh, and being able to uh, pull people to or bring people together, pull and deploy capital, uh, is really uh, where I think the long-term value of what we're we're building should accrete to over time. Um, uh, so one point before we jump into something else, just a, a sense check in my own mind. An LLC is typically what a law firm would actually use as a structure, right? In the US, I don't know the equivalent in the UK is an LLP. Um, a little bit, yeah. So, so lots of law firms are LLPs. Uh, LLCs are, are tend to be used for various different uh, funds. Uh, so different fund structures tend to be LLCs, uh, along with lots of different small businesses. It's an incredibly flexible uh, structure uh, that actually Wyoming pioneered back in the 1970s that blends the best parts of partnerships from a tax perspective with the best parts of a corporation from a limitation of liability perspective. And for a lawyer, it's a little bit like uh, when a programmer opens up uh, an editor of some sort and wants to program. It's a pretty much a blank slate, and you can define all the rules uh, that you want the organization to abide by uh, for the most part, and with limited exception, uh, using a contract. So it's the purest expression of freedom of contract that, that we have. And unlike other jurisdictions, there's no need to have somebody in charge. Uh, so I don't know if this is just something that's uniquely American, but in many parts of the world, uh, you actually have to have a manager, somebody that's ultimately responsible for the organization. Uh, with LLCs, they can be member managed uh, and you can enjoy the tax benefits of a partnership and the limitation of liability of a corporation. So you kind of have a blank slate to play around with things. Uh, beyond that, and I know uh, you mentioned this before, you know, in these contracts, you can also define how you want to administer disputes. Uh, so using contracts, you should be able to set up uh, the infrastructure to build decentralized arbitration systems, uh, systems that uh, where people can administer their disputes and also make sure that if there is a dispute and a resolution of that, that dispute, that it will be enforced uh, in the real world. You know, law doesn't evaporate just because you decide to pick up, um, you know, pick up some code and and develop that, uh, or you decide to deploy that on a blockchain. Uh, courts and jurisdictions still have authority over. Uh, the actions of people that live within their jurisdiction. And so uh, building these bridges so that they work uh, kind of with these legacy institutions is critically important. Yeah. And that was going to be my next big question, which is, you know, so the mantra since the early days of Ethereum has been code is law. And like to what extent can code be law? And how does, an, you know, increasingly people talk about a DAO or even a protocol as a jurisdiction in its own right. So how do these two, or a proto-jurisdiction, how how do, can code be law? Or to what extent can code be law? And then, you know, how do these different, this emergent or proto-jurisdiction interact with existing jurisdictions? Yeah, you know, the notion of code is law, a great academic, Lawrence Lessig, um, kind of uh, coined that phrase uh, during Web 1. Uh, when he was thinking about uh, how code can be used to influence people uh, and almost acts as like a regulatory uh, mechanism. Um, I think with blockchains, and this is what Primavera, DeFilippi, and I wrote, wrote about in our book, uh, you, you basically have that concept, um, but you've placed it on steroids. Uh, so now you're able to not just uh, build systems that influence people, but you can actually build systems that... <clears throat> precisely define how people should interact, uh, how um, how uh, the rules of the game. Uh, you know, we've obviously seen this in large blockchain-based networks like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, we're starting to see this more and more on DeFi platforms, um, which are kind of defining, uh, you know, how folks should interact with one another. Uh, but ultimately, law is law, right? Uh, law is uh, something that a state is, um, adopts uh, through whatever process that they choose. Uh, but at the same time, using contracts, and this is why recording contracting systems are so important, uh, by using contracts, uh, groups of people can decide and define that that code or code-based systems uh, are uh, how they decide to operate. 
Uh, so you're able to, to opt into these systems if you so choose. Um, and you can do that quite easily if it's wrapped in a more traditional legal agreement. So you can have an agreement that says where we want to form a DAO, as an example, um, and we want to make sure that all the operations of how we interact with one another will be defined by the underlying smart contract code. Um, and if you do that, um, and if it's presented in the right way, and if you have you know, various different arbitration clauses uh, to deal with disputes, uh, there's not that much, at least in the US, uh, that a court can do to disrupt that. Uh, so that's why this stuff is critically important. So if that's somebody's mantra, if that's the vision of where they want to go, if they want to start building towards kind of a proto jurisdiction, like you were describing, one way to create the space for that in the global economy is to kind of en ensconce it in contracts uh, between parties to manage those risks and to make it clear uh, what you're entering into. And so is that, at least in the short to midterm, really weaning actors off the requirement to resolve things through you know the traditional means within the jurisdiction and to just solve for things digitally is there any recourse so for example um if if a DAO is operated uh, by a handful of people they're all in physically based in different jurisdictions of course they subscribe to um they subscribe to let's say wyoming law um, but they have a dispute. Is there precedence over a jurisdiction? You know, could somebody in France say, well, actually, I feel aggrieved and I'm going to take this to a French court? Or do they have to always uh, defer to the, um, the, ju the jurisdiction where that entity is formed? So um, you can include in contracts things like forum selection clauses, choice of law cl clauses, et cetera, uh, which will make it incredibly difficult for the French person, in your example, uh, to bring a, a case in France. Uh, if, a, if a judge uh, or a court in France looks at that, they see the, con the contract in place, they see an arbitration clause, I would say most uh, more advanced economies will uh, abide by uh, that arbitration provision. So there may be certain jurisdictional peculiarities, maybe certain ways to, to void those out, but it's a pretty narrow um, it's it's a pretty narrow narrow attack vector uh, to uh, to try to do that, and particularly in the U.S., if you uh, you have in your agreement arbitration provisions, choice of law provisions, choice of forum provisions, uh, it's it's pretty hard to uh, to impeach those. Fascinating. Um, so you've mentioned Wyoming, and of course, where crypto chooses to base itself at the moment to you know create its foundations to issue tokens out of um, are in places like Switzerland, Singapore, um, uh, Bermuda, Wyoming, you know, Malta, fairly exotic places compared to you know, where most of these people are physically based, for example, relatively um, small uh, nation states, but where I guess they have greater latitude to to innovate and, and work with a nascent industry like crypto. Um, to what extent, so in parallel, it's worth saying, I'm reading Treasure Island at the moment, which is um, a fascinating book on the offshore system and uh, around tax avoidance and how much wealth is actually held um, in, in these environments as opposed to in taxable uh, uh, environments like the US, UK, et cetera. Um, to what extent are you seeing the formation of the crypto industry happen in effectively offshore environments? And you know, what, what do you think the kind of societal implications of that could be if you know, the next phase of the internet, um, most of that economic value is, is governed in those jurisdictions? Yeah, I think it, that's a great question. Um, the uh, many, like you noted, many of the reasons why people set up in foreign jurisdictions are either uh, to deal with some naughty tax-related issues, uh, or it's a perception that uh, you can avoid a particular re uh, regulatory scheme like the U.S. or, or parts of Europe uh, by setting up an entity uh, in those foreign jurisdictions. The latter hasn't really panned out, um, so it's been difficult. 
uh, just to set up an entity in another jurisdiction um, and claim that, let's say, you're out of the purview of U.S. regulators. Um, we've we've clearly uh, seen that in cases like BitMEX, where the core entity uh, was organized in the Seychelles, but at the same time, uh, they had developers in the U.S. The U.S. government had no problem cracking down on them um, because they believed that there was some sort of um, um, an issue uh, or various different violations. Um, my sense is, though, just to kind of take this up a little bit, um, there will be one jurisdiction or a handful of jurisdictions that kind of nail the right approach for how to set up these DAO-like structures. Um, and since they operate globally, uh, if the rules related to it are clear, if there's clear regulatory guidance, if people know that uh, the way that they want to organize their affairs um, will be enforced uh, locally, uh, that jurisdiction probably will become quite large uh, and will become the place for these entities to, to be set up. Uh, we've seen this in the US. US companies may operate across the various different 50 states, uh, but they tend to organize in only a handful of states because they know that the rules are clear, they know what they're getting into, um, and that enables them to operate not just here in the US, but globally. Uh, so states like Delaware, uh, most you know Fortune 500 companies and lots of other companies around the globe will be organized in Delaware uh, just because uh, they kind of know the setup, they know the rules of the game. Uh, I think the same thing's gonna happen with DAOs and some of this uh, forum shopping, um, you know, probably will diminish over time, uh, you know, as certain regulatory questions uh, begin to get addressed. Um, and I think where we're moving towards for lots of the projects, and we funded at this point about like 30 plus projects through the lab, we're seeing that, that kind of the next generation of, of blockchain companies are probably going to be moving towards these DAO structures. Uh, so they're going to be deploying uh, smart contracts that are managed uh, primarily via DAO uh, with a governance token that's sitting on top. Um, and maybe that maybe there's um, some light uh, regarding contracting work uh, between members of the DAO uh, just to make sure uh, that certain risks are accounted for. Um, and once that happens, uh, I think that uh, we'll start to see more and more projects kind of walk down that path. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. You think that with time, a particular jurisdiction will kind of dominate the space. And I guess that make, would make sense. So we had the, I don't think prime minister is the right term, but you know the elected leader in Bermuda, um, which I actually didn't know so much uh, prior to the interview, but Bermuda is a, a global center for um, insurance and reinsurance. Uh, is it Bermuda or Barbados? Bermuda, I think Bermuda, right? Bermuda, yeah. That's right. yeah. Bermuda um, came came in BBI. Right. And that is a you know global center, tiny population of like 15,000 people um, on an island. But yeah, that is the global center for insurance and reinsurance. Um, and it has regulatory equivalents with both the US and Europe. Um, and so, you know, similarly, I guess various jurisdictions are looking at this as a, as a land grab. And, and that would certainly feel intuitive that history would repeat itself there. Um, and, you know, I think whilst, of course, there, there might be valid concerns around either an extension or continuation of what we see in offshore generally in banking, financial services, in, in crypto. At the same time, um, you know, crypto is inherently global. And so, for example, Outlier is, a, is an LLP structure um, with an offshore component. And that's primarily because we're not all Brits based in the UK. We're kind of a group of people from all over the world uh, and we kind of settle our say tax in the jurisdiction that we happen to reside in at the time so you know if you then apply that to hundreds thousands tens of thousands of, of people distributed everywhere it, it, it makes sense that you would leverage that kind of global offshore infrastructure um, to accommodate that so you mentioned some of uh, the DAOs that you've invested, I think you said 30 via the Lao. Um, and I know you're also working, um, you've kind of collaborated with Moloch DAO. Um, more recently, uh, aside from the Lao, you've done the Flamingo DAO, which is an NFT DAO. And you've got, I think you said, three, four, five more lined up, including a liquidity DAO. Could you talk us through um, the collaboration with Moloch and um, the other kind of instances of DAOs that you've been working with? Yeah, sure. So, you know, Malik DAO I thought was uh, really a, a game changer. Um, you know, the DAO itself was an incredibly interesting concept. Um, and once uh, I saw Malik, 
uh, I realized that uh, it seems like we solved, at least in part, some of the smart contract issues uh, with how to build DAOs. Um, so due to the great work of Amin, and James Young, and a whole bunch of other uh, fantastic uh, developers, uh, you know, Malik was summoned uh, off the bat. Uh, but Malik had one flaw, uh, or one flaw uh, initially, which is it could pull capital and deploy that to another party, but it couldn't accept in to it, um, um, uh, or sorry, it couldn't accept into it uh, any uh, assets from another organization. So kind of the, the full loop wasn't wasn't there. Uh, so starting uh, about a year and a half ago, um, uh, around ETH Berlin uh, in 20, I think that was 2018, uh, August 2018, I uh, started to talk to Amin and some others just about how we could extend it uh, so that we could start to and not just build grant giving DAOs, but also other forms of DAOs, uh, most notably like a more venture style DAO. Uh, so uh, we began to think about what uh, V2 could look like uh, with the core uh, innovation added uh, to V2 uh, being the ability to accept into the DAO other forms of assets. Uh, so I mean, um, uh, folks on our side and also folks from the medical cartel ecosystem began to knock our heads together we began to implement the smart contracts. Uh, we got them audited uh, by co you know, consensus diligence, um, and we spent some time on our end doing the legal structure and work related to it. Uh, so now um, with Moloch V2, we have the ability to play around with lots of different fund or fund-like structures, uh, which is pretty awesome. Um, and what we're building out uh, with the Lao uh, and Lao members is not just one DAO, but an entire ecosystem of DAOs. So imagine, uh, if you can, if Silicon Valley or every fund around the globe had the same core operating system. Uh, that operating system being Ethereum, um, Ethereum-based smart contracts, uh, open law, uh, automation tooling for all the legal paperwork, um, and obviously other assets that may uh, get you know pegged or wrapped or somehow um, appended to the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, that would be incredibly powerful. Right? You've standardized things kind of across the board so that these organizations uh, don't just um, interact as separate islands, but actually can talk, communicate, pass information, do a whole bunch of different things uh, together. Uh, so the Lao was kind of our first, uh, first kind of uh, mothership, our mother DAO, um, and uh, through that we've been able to, um, you know, collect um, about seven million dollars worth of ether, uh, deploy that to lots of great projects in the, the ecosystem. Um, but more broadly, we've also thought about where these structures can work in other in other areas. So the members themselves of the Lao uh, have been thinking about how these DAO structures uh, can get rolled out. One of the first ideas that we had here was thinking about the NFT ecosystem, uh, not just um, from uh, funding the, the underlying infrastructure, but also the NFTs themselves. Uh, so we've been able to pull together a second DAO, uh, which again, it has the same core operating system as the Lao, and the Lao obviously has a stake in, um, in Flamingo DAO. Uh, to actually acquire uh, act, you know, individual NFTs. Uh, so that launched uh, about a month or so ago. Uh, we've already started to acquire a whole bunch of NFTs. Uh, the idea there, uh, much like with the Lao and the DAO itself, is that this hive mind, uh, this approach of pulling together a whole bunch of dis disparate people online, you can begin to kind of cut through the noise. Uh, you can source uh, strategies, uh, get feedback on them, and kind of uh, take the right steps. Uh, so we've been able to uh, do that with the Lao and also with Flamingo. Uh, what's coming next is uh, now that we've backed 30 plus projects, we realize that many of these projects um, are uh, using some sort of uh, liquidity uh, pool uh, or some or have or intend to have some form of liquidity mining um, uh, possibilities that will be related to them. Uh, so we are launching a third DAO, um, hopefully. Uh, by the end of the year, if not early next year, uh, that will be focused on liquidity mining. Uh, so that means if uh, you have assets, uh, if you're not able to understand what opportunities are there when it comes to liquidity mining, which projects to back, uh, you'll have kind of a, a group of folks that are able to kind of weigh in and, and assess those risks and opportunities. Uh, after that, uh, we've been looking uh, really closely at uh, the personal token space uh, and likely we'll be launching a DAO uh, that's focused on uh, how uh, we can help 
uh, artists or other creative workers, influencers begin to uh, begin to think about launching uh, various different personal tokens. Uh, we think that that's going to be quite big in 2021. And then the last thing that we have cooking is that we have version three of Moloch that we've been working on, what well, we're considering version three. The Moloch community will have to accept it. Uh, that version three of Moloch uh, will create DAO structures that are incredibly modular. Uh, so you can actually plug into it different modules um, into your organization. Um, and beyond that, you'll have no cost governance voting and exceptionally low cost asset transfers. So one of the downsides right now with DAOs is that it costs a lot to uh, get and have people weigh in for certain events. Um, we've been able to uh, adapt some of the work that Snapshot and the Balancer team has done uh, so that we can have the low cost governance voting. Uh, but we figured out a way to have low cost asset transfers. Uh, so that means that people can decide um, how they want to transfer assets without burning a whole bunch of different gas. Uh, so that will get rolled out uh, probably early next year as well. Um, but what that means is instead of being tethered to one ecosystem like Aragon, and they've done incredible work, um, we basically are at a point where we can um, have the DAO ecosystem develop like we saw the token ecosystem develop with various different ERC standards where you deploy kind of a spine of a DAO and then you can plug and play different pieces um, into it uh, to build any type of organization that you want. So that, that's the type of stuff that we're working on. Wow, fascinating. I mean, just as you were talking, I've made notes about seven different um, flavors of DAO that I could think of across our our portfolio that I'm definitely going to hit you up on after the end of the show. Um, final question, because I'm conscious of time. Uh, you know, there's a lot of debate around the role and power of executive in decentralized systems, in particular DAOs. You know, what what's your perspective as 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 a lawyer and now somebody that's helping people structure DAOs? You know, how do you balance the requirement for an executive? So one of the arguments is, you know, how do you um, you need an empowered executive to be able to contract between DAOs or um, if you're an early stage DAO and you're an equivalent of a lean startup, you need to be able to iterate quickly without getting bogged down in, in votes. Like, what, what's, your, what's your perspective, both philosophically and then, I guess, empirically based on your experiences so far? Yeah, I, I don't know if you necessarily need an executive. Um, I think that there's a desire for that. Um, because that's all we know today. Uh, but you're starting to see glimmers of uh, groups and organizations that are not really driven by, um, you know, one primary or a handful of executives. Uh, so, you know, Yearn or YFI, it's a great example here. There's obviously somebody that created it, uh, somebody that, that brought it to, to life, uh, but there's not one single person, um, you know, pushing that forward um, and helping to grow out that ecosystem. And that ecosystem is growing incredibly fast, right? We're starting to see not just that project, but a whole bunch of other projects that are getting appended onto that ecosystem, uh, not merging, but kind of collaborating or in other ways, interacting with that. And I think that that's not surprising because we saw a similar approach with both Bitcoin um, and Ethereum. Um, you know, with Bitcoin, we don't even know who the founder is, uh, and yet we've seen it kind of grow to this global giant uh, an increasingly powerful network uh, without having one core leader. Uh, Ethereum, we knew who the leaders are, but those leaders never had kind of final say over anything. Um, they were kind of more guiding the ship, almost like herders, uh, as opposed to uh, you know dictating um, uh, how things should go, more like managers uh, or general partners. Um, so my, philosophically, I think that that is where things are going. Um, and philosophically, I just think DAO structures uh, will be able to not just uh, beat existing structures, uh, but, um, but in many ways, uh, vastly surpass them uh, because they're better able to marshal information. And that's what we've been seeing with the Lao. Uh, we have uh, 57 plus members uh, who are scouring the internet for various different opportunities and are able to bring that back into the Lao uh, to see whether or not this is something other folks are interested in. So if there's questions about whether or not a project is good, if there's technical questions, if there's all these little issues that come up when folks are evaluating whether or not to back a project, um, you know, having two managers or their small team be able to assess that is one thing. You know, having a whole 
clan of people that are able to do that. And hopefully over time, you know, even, even other folks that are not core members, but are just on the periphery weigh in and, and work or, or provide some sort of input, uh, I just think is a vastly superior model. And when you couple that with uh, much lower costs uh, operating these things, um, and I, I just think that that's a winning combination. Uh, to me, and this is why uh, I've always been fascinated with DAOs, uh, they're the purest ex expression of private ordering. Uh, so the ability of people to order their affairs uh, the way that they see fit without interference from a state actor uh, or a manager. Uh, and I think that that is uh, where the internet is going. I think that's the best way in such a, a large disparate global system that we're operating uh, to operate. Uh, and I think uh, the power of the technology that many of us are fascinated with is that it is now feasible to do that. Uh, we have this trusted infrastructure uh, in a blockchain uh, so that even if we don't know one another, uh, even if we're not in the same place, we're able to work together in a way that's productive, in a way that hopefully makes the lives of people around us better, uh, and hopefully can ensure that we can feed our families, um, uh, make sure that we can take care of our, our friends, um, and hopefully uh, have a little bit left over at the end of the day. Uh, and I think that that's in incredibly important. Um, and I think it's also important because we're seeing, uh, particularly in the blockchain ecosystem, that lots of the great projects and teams and artists and creators, they're not just based in the US, they're not just based in a small corridor of California, they're not just based in parts of Europe, uh, they're global, right? Some of the best teams uh, don't have access to capital, they don't have access to the support that they need in their local jurisdictions, uh, but by you know, moving into the blockchain ecosystem, uh, by gaining access to global pools of capital, uh, they can they can fulfill what they're hoping to fulfill, they can build what they wanna build, uh, they can you know hopefully improve their lot uh, just like the rest of us. And I think that that's really important uh, and something that we're deeply committed to. Aaron, I think no better point to end than on that wonderful vision. Um, incredibly optimistic one as well, which we all need right now in the world. Um, thanks so much for coming on the show. I wish you the best of luck with, uh, you said it's the third DAO that's going to be released imminently, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, if you are interested in learning more, um, you know, make sure to Check us out on Twitter. We'll we'll talk some more about that. Uh, join our Telegram group or feel free to send us a note. Uh, thanks so much, Jamie. Really appreciate your time. Thanks. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please make sure you subscribe, rate, and share your feedback to help us reach as many people as possible with the important mission of Web3.